It wasn't so very many years ago when just about every available berth along the River Thames, stretching right up into the Pool of London itself, was in constant use by ocean-going merchant ships. Every high tide saw the raising of London's historic Tower Bridge to allow them their passageway to or from the open sea. Ships of all kinds were crammed into the many river inlets and man-made docks, like here in London's mighty Royal Group, where ships of so many famous companies lay, tended by thousands of dockside workers. There was such congestion that some even berthed at the bottom of streets. Thousands of new young recruits were constantly needed. The shipping companies helped to finance sea training schools and ships. The National Sea Training School ship, Vindicatrix, maintained a relentless schedule at its permanent berth in Sharpness. These lads, mostly aged just 16 and usually away from home for the first time, were given the most rigorous training in austere conditions. Stale bread, together with a thin brown gruel, nicknamed Scouse, was their basic daily diet. Every morning at 6am they took ice-cold showers before a gruelling work schedule. They had just two old grubby blankets for bedding and no heating of any kind, not even during the most severe of winters. It was a very, very hard life, and even if a boy dared to complain, he wouldn't find anyone to listen to him. But these training schools did give these boys a sense of camaraderie and a training that would enable them to face up to any situation or emergency at sea. Another training school for boys was on the River Thames at Gravesend. The loop is formed in the rope on top of the standing part and the end is brought up through the loop, round the back of the standing part and back down through the loop again, a bowling. Now I'd like you all to try it with me. Make a loop in the rope. Take the end up through the loop, round the back of the standing part, and back down through the loop again. A bowling. Oh, Mayor, yours is wrong. Let me see yours, Roberts. That's right. Here we have a standard layout for afternoon teas. Dress cloth. Boys came to these schools from all over the country. Many had never seen a ship in real life before. There was no turning back, short of escaping through the perimeter fences at night, which some actually did. But most stuck it out because they all shared the same burning ambition to join the Navy and see the world. They first had to learn the necessary skills to become deckhands or commie waiters and then had to pass rigorous exams. These many thousands of ordinary boys, mostly from extremely poor backgrounds with precious little opportunity in life, were given this wonderful chance to make something special of their lives. Those from better backgrounds had the chance to become cadet officers and serve aboard one of the country's elite training ships, such as HMS Worcester, moored in the Thames. Many of these young cadets had the good fortune of a top education, and shipping companies often sponsored their two-year training course. Others had parents who were only too willing and able to pay the training ship's modest fees so that their sons could become officers in what was then the biggest and best merchant navy in the world. Some inevitably failed and returned ashore, but for those who'd passed their exams, the time came to join their first ship. In each major port, the Shipping Federation had its own labour office, responsible for crewing its ships. Ratings were given the right to refuse up to two ships offered to them, but had to accept the third. This, albeit limited right to choose a ship of their choice, did give crew members tremendous freedom. British ships at that time went to just about every port on the globe. If they wanted a few fun weeks in South America, then they signed on with Royal Mail. They went to Africa with Union Castle, the Far East with Blue Funnel, or the South Sea Islands with the New Zealand Shipping Company. So getting the right ship and being with the right caring company was all important. And if they were really lucky, they sometimes ended up aboard a brand new ship like Portline's Port Sydney. Stillness falls across London's Royal Docks the evening before sailing day. On the early morning tide, the stylish Port Sydney sails on only her second voyage on a journey around the world.
Port Sydney's Doxford diesels were soon into their familiar rhythm, propelling her twin screws to a very healthy service speed of 17 knots. Built at Swan Hunter Newcastle Yards in 1954, at 9,992 gross tonnes, the Port Sydney was one of the most modern and streamlined ships in the British Merchant Navy at that time. And with single berth cabins for all her crew, it was easy to understand why these ships were so very popular. Port Lime was considered by most crews to be one of the best shipping companies in the world. But there was still no escaping the dreaded boat drill, better known by the crew as Board of Trade Sports. From the 1950s onwards, most port line ships carried just 12 passengers in comparative luxury. Food was the equal of any transatlantic liner. And there weren't too many complaints about the grub from the port line crews either. Founded as the Commonwealth and Dominion Line in 1914 by a coming together of four already established family shipping companies, it became officially registered as Port Line in November 1937 and was a very young company in shipping terms. Port Sydney could boast of having the very latest navigational equipment and her sleek lines were kept in pristine condition as was the case with all port line ships. The first ship of the new line to carry the port prefix was the Port Darwin in 1918. After this all the ships in the fleet were named after ports in Australia and New Zealand and so they became known affectionately as the port boats. Early morning found the Port Sydney slipping gracefully through the calm blue waters of the Red Sea towards the Port of Aden to refuel. For those young crew members on their first sea voyage, the heat and atmosphere of this medieval port were quite alien. Then out to sea once again on a course set for another strange and magical port, Hong Kong. One of the hardest things to find on any port line ship was rust and many of their rather envious rivals jokingly questioned whether they ever went to sea at all because they looked so immaculate. The first sight of Hong Kong Harbour in those relatively unsophisticated and distant days was a memory young crew members would remember forever no longer just the name of some strange and distant place on an atlas, but a reality. A postcard from here would have quite an effect on all back home in cold and wintry England. After several days exploring the wonders of Hong Kong, not all of which could be written about in a letter back home to the family, Port Sydney headed back out to sea on the last leg of her voyage to Australia.
1916, Cunard took over all the shares in the company, and after the First World War ended, the famous Cunard funnel colours were adopted. A passing ship at dusk signalled that the coast of Australia was not far away. Just over four weeks since setting sail from London's Royal Docks, the Port Sydney arrived safely at Port Kembla in New South Wales, where she'd stay for just two days before going on to Sydney, further along the coast. Back home in London's Royal Docks, more portline ships discharged and loaded their cargoes. The Port Napier has moved her from 1012 Albert round to 4 King George to continue this charge, and then I think she sails on the 21st. Man? Calling Plangent, calling Plangent, over. What is your position, Plan Gent? Over. I'm at 1 kg, sir, near the cutting bridge. Over, sir. All right, proceed immediately. The city of Exeter and the 13th Albert Dock have sent the ship to the Rockham's Tower. Over and out. Even in those much more leisurely days, a ship in port cost money. The priority of shoreside staff was to ensure trouble-free turnarounds and to get the ships back out to sea again as soon as possible. In the case of London, that usually meant approximately four weeks. Giving the crews between two to three weeks of precious shore leave with their families and loved ones before their next epic voyage. The most heart-wrenching time for a crew to sail was just before Christmas, but they joined in the festivities wherever they were. The Port Adelaide was in the Pacific Ocean, nearing the coast of New Zealand. And in Auckland's hot Christmas sunshine, the crowds were awaiting the arrival of Santa himself. Other ships of the fleet, like the Port Townsville and Port Fremantle, were enjoying much more traditional Christmas weather in the frozen eastern seaboard of North America. Past a long line of familiar ships, the Port Chalmers made her way slowly out of London's Royal Docks on her way to New Zealand. The heavily industrialised banks of the Thames of those days slipped gradually past as Port Chalmers quickened her pace as she neared the open seas. Far to the east, off the coast of Africa, an older portline ship made her way south. And nearing the equator, the Port Hobart prepared for a special port line crossing the line ceremony. 
they didn't teach him this at that sea training school. And when all the ducking had been done, there was a special port line crossing the line certificate to show the folks back home that you really had crossed the equator. The Port Chalmers had reached Panama on her long voyage to New Zealand. There were few more pleasing and spectacular sights than those of New Zealand for the port line crews. Ships would often spend as long as three months in this beautiful country, discharging and loading cargo from its mass of small ports. Many crew members fell in love with local girls and ended up living there, so far away from those sea training schools that they'd started at. Port Lion was growing all the time, with new, bigger and better ships being built for them. Here, at the Belfast yards of Holland and Wolf, Stock number 1483 was given to another new port line ship. This was the 10,470 gross ton Port Melbourne. After the successful launch, the dignitaries and special guests were invited to watch the Port Melbourne's powerful diesel engines being tested. The highly skilled work of fitting the ship out was extremely demanding, every tiny little nut and bolt having to fit exactly into place with no margin for error. Here in the joiner's shop, craftsmen were busy making the furniture for the Port Melbourne and all the other ships being built at those famous yards. In the meantime, the H&W opposed piston propelling engine had been dismantled and was taken to the ship in sections to be re-erected.
Every passing day took her closer to completion, and now she was ready to have a mainmast fitted. And her giant streamlined 25-ton funnel was taken slowly from the boiler shop to the ship. The twin propellers that would help her to reach speeds in excess of 17 knots were manoeuvred into place. And gradually, the magnificent design of the Port Melbourne began to reveal itself. As the Port Melbourne left her builder's yards for her sea trials, no one would have guessed that her active life with Port Line, along with her near sister Port Sydney, would last for only 18 years. But this wasn't to be the end of their careers. It's testimony to their design that in 1973 they were both converted into cruise liners, each carrying over 500 passengers in total luxury. Both ships ended their days with the Greek Costa Line, the Port Sydney as the 16,310 gross ton Daphne and the Port Melbourne as the 16,300 gross ton Danai. Port Line will always be remembered with nothing but the fondest memories by all of the thousands of people who worked and sailed with its fleet of most magnificent ships. At that time, they played a major part in helping to make the British Merchant Navy the biggest and best in the world. Across the sea in Scotland, the 11,282 gross ton Ben Glow was launched from the Glasgow yards of C. Connell for another famous British shipping company, William Thompson's Ben Line. miles to the south, the London Transport Trolley Bus was taking a first-time crew member through the early morning mist towards London's Royal Docks. There, waiting at the quayside, was the Ben Glow's sister ship, the 11,463 gross ton Ben Loyal. It's difficult to imagine the feelings and thoughts that filled this boy's mind as, fresh out of sea school, he walked nervously into the maze of this foreign and intimidating world to join his very first ship. Hearts might be heavy at leaving home for this long adventure, but it was too late to turn and run. There was no going back. 
there was the same sort of feeling that you get on the first day at a new school, soaking up the atmosphere inside a real ship and searching for your very own cabin. Nothing at sea school could quite prepare you for this moment, a moment when you suddenly felt one of the loneliest people in the world. But Ben Loyal had seen it all before, and her priority was to load the last of her cargo and be ready to sail on the morning tide. Down below, the galley staff prepared the first meal of the voyage. Up on deck, other members of Ben Loyal's crew set about the unenviable task of washing away the worst of London's grime as her single screw turbines propelled her through the English Channel at a speedy 20 knots. days out from London and in the Bay of Biscay, one of the big Orient liners majestically overhauled Ben Loyal on her way to Suez, the Far East in Australia. A few days later and excitement grew on the bridge as another ship of the Ben Line fleet, the 10,302 gross ton Ben Vraki was sighted, homeward bound with a cargo of timber, rubber and rice. One bell coming up and time for the crew coming off watch to have a well-earned cuppa. There was a touch more class and refinement for Ben Loyal's officers and passengers. There was no escaping boat drill held at least once a week. Every crew member in those days had a lifeboat certificate, which meant that in theory, even the youngest, the 16-year-olds, were capable of handling these large and rather cumbersome boats. On some ships today, you might be lucky to find someone who knew where the lifeboats were. The sea began to warm as Ben Loyal turned into the Mediterranean on her way to Suez. The more seasoned crew members would tell the new boys the sorts of things they could expect to see and find there. The portside pilots were well known to the Ben Line captains and their navigational skills were greatly respected. Slow ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Engine bad, sir. Yep. That's a pilot line coming down, sir. Pilot line, sir, line's clear. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. 
morning and welcome. Morning, Captain. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. An old and familiar friend from home was waiting at anchor as Ben Loyal started to enter the Suez Canal. The company had used the vital waterway since it was first opened in 1869. Before the Suez Canal was built, the very powerful P&O company had developed an overland route across the Isthmus of Suez. Cargo and passengers transshipped at Alexandria and Suez were carried across the desert by camel and horse-drawn vehicles. Depots and workshops were established at both ends of the route, along which there was a chain of rest houses. The pampered passengers of today's luxury air-conditioned cruise ships would scarcely cope with that kind of hardship. The notorious portside bumboats would have been there to greet those hardy and intrepid passengers of yesteryear. But so were the benboats. So massive was the P&O operation that no fewer than 170 sailing ships, including the Thompson vessels, were employed to carry coal to P&O's eastern refueling depots. These ships then set out to find return cargoes to make their voyages more profitable. This is how Benline developed its knowledge of the complex markets of the Far East. After 15 hours in the canal, Ben Loyal was heading out into the warm blue waters of the Red Sea. To operate efficiently on these routes to the Far East, ships had to be capable of carrying a wide range of cargoes. Ben Lyme was well versed in the art of handling the challenges of even live pigs. The origins of the company dated right back to 1825, when two young brothers, Alexander and William Thompson, set up a shipbroking partnership based in Leith. They had their first ship, the Carrara, built in 1839 and put her on the Italian run carrying coal and woolen goods outward and returning with a cargo of Carrara marble. This was in great demand in Scotland at that time and supplied another profitable part of the family business, the Leith Marble Works. Three days out of Suez and the temperature was really beginning to hot up. Whites were now the order of the day. For a new cadet, this was the signal that at last he really was sailing among those far-off places he daydreamed about for so long. There was a very satisfying feeling of power, being aboard a big ship at full speed, as Ben Loyal sailed towards a next port of call, Aden. pilot had to make the somewhat precarious climb up the rope ladder while the ship was still underway. One of the big BTC tankers coming out from Little Eden then, I think. Little Eden, Little Eden. Yes, yes. Dead slow ahead, sir. Dead slow ahead, sir. Engine's very ahead, sir. Yeah. Port doesn't seem to be too busy. We HFs made an awful difference at this place. Oh, right. Helm midships. were secured for the Ben Loyal to start taking on the oil to fuel her powerful engines. Mm -hmm. 
Next came the long 3,000 mile haul to Malaya through the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea, across the Bay of Bengal to the port of Penang. It was three weeks since they'd left London. Nearing Penang, yet another pilot was needed to navigate the tricky waters. Pilot left Ben Loyal, having seen her safely to her anchorage in the roads. Next came the welcome sight of one of the agent staff boarding with mail for the crew and the latest instructions for the remainder of Ben Loyal's outward voyage. This was followed by the not-so-welcome sight of the port health officials, immigration and customs. A signal had to be made to the shore for more lighters as cargo was discharged from Ben Loyal's holds. These were the great days of British manufacturing. British vehicles and goods were shipped to every corner of the world. of brightly dressed pilgrims added extra colour to the already bustling quayside scene as they made their way to the ship that was about to take them to Mecca. What a contrast to the far distant cold and misty quaysides of London's Royal Docks where another ship of the fleet, the Ben Arty, was setting sail on a voyage to New Zealand. Cadets and boy ratings were often the targets of well-tried practical jokes. A popular one was to tell them that they had to save their food to feed the mules that pulled the ships through the Panama Canal. Imagine their embarrassment when they discovered that these were the mules they'd gone hungry for. Ships would spend at least one night in Panama, allowing the crew some much welcomed shore leave, and for first timers some mind-blowing experiences they most certainly wouldn't be admitting to in their next airmail letter home to Mum. The soothing breeze across the restful southern seas relaxed even the most hardened of men.
Could Alexander and William Thompson ever possibly have imagined way back in 1825 that their work would one day result in a large fleet operating such fine ships as the 10,142 gross ton Ben Riok sailing down the English Channel at 17 and a half knots? There was the 8,879 gross ton 15 knot Ben Larrick seen here in Singapore. The Blytheswood Shipbuilding Company built her for the Prince Line in 1944. The 8,008 gross ton 16 knot Ben Rinnis had been built in America in 1943 as the auxiliary aircraft carrier Perdido. The 9,952 gross ton 15 knot Ben Hope seen here offshore discharging ammunitions. She was built in 1945 by Barclay Curl and Company for the Anchor Line Limited as the Egidia. The 9,767 gross ton Ben Vorlich, about to sail from Hong Kong for Hamburg, a voyage that would take her 29 days at her service speed of 15 knots. More modern, faster ships in the fleet were already capable of cutting seven days off that time. The 7,845 gross ton, 15 and a half knot Ben McDewey, sailing from Bangkok as the monsoon clouds gathered. This was the first ship to be built for the Ben line after World War II. Benvenu, a ship of the same class, sailing up the river to Bangkok with a cargo of cars, machinery, textiles and Scotch whisky. It wasn't until 1954 that ocean-going ships were able to berth at Klong Toy, the port of Bangkok. Before then, the river was too shallow and they had to anchor at the mouth of the river. The 7,755 gross ton 16 knot Ben Mahore, built in 1949 at the Blythe Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company, waiting here at the quayside in Singapore for a shipment of latex being sent by train from the plantations. The 8,738 gross ton 15 knot Ben Naki, taking on general cargo at Bangkok. She was built at the Sunderland Yards of J.L. Thompson & Sons in 1949. Completed in 1951 by the Blythe Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company, the 8,038 gross ton Ben Ato unloading cargo in Singapore. In this very rare film, we see one of the first containers ever used. It was extremely small, but it took a small army of dockers to handle it. At this time, few were convinced that there was any real future for containerization. Back to Ben Loyal now, and she'd continued her voyage, reaching the mouth of the river leading to Bangkok. The pilot met her to guide her 25 miles along the winding river to the new harbour of Klong Toy. Only a narrow channel had been dredged deep enough for Ben Loyal's passage. It left little room for manoeuvre, and the Thai pilot had to use every bit of his skill and experience. Funnels Menetheus passes close by in that narrow channel. These two ships enjoyed a healthy rivalry. 
But although crews from other shipping companies also treated each other with a certain amount of respect, there was no shortage of competitive skullduggery. If it came to the crunch, they'd spy on one another and go to extreme lengths to be the first to sail, to make sure they got a profitable contract or secured a precious berth at the next port. This sometimes involves some outrageous foul play, like pretending to accidentally damage the stern of a rival ship with an anchor whilst docking. Steady as she goes, eh? Stop the engine, cover her. At 17 and a half knots, Ben Riok was ploughing her way through the China Sea on her way to Hong Kong. Built in 1952 at the Glasgow Yards of C. Connell and Company, her speed provided a new, fast, direct service between London and Singapore. In effect, it was a hard-working shuttle service. In 1955, the passage time of 22 days between the commercial capitals of East and West was remarkable. This new connection was popular with both merchants and passengers. But even back in the 1950s, in the skies, there were the early warnings of dramatic changes that were coming, which were going to help to destroy the British shipping industry. Ben Riok's first sister ship, the Ben Vraki, shared the fast service to Singapore their sleek lines presented a magnificent sight as they travelled back and forth through the waters of the Far East. Many cargo ships at this time carried just 12 passengers, any more than 12, and the company would have been obliged to provide a ship's doctor, and this was a luxury they really couldn't afford. But there were few complaints from the Ben Line passengers who travelled at a leisurely pace in splendid style. The 10,325 gross tonne Ben Lohman discharging general cargo in Hong Kong. Launched in 1957 from the same Connell Yards in Glasgow, she brought the number of ships on the new fast service up to four. In 1958, Ben Lyon introduced the Ben Loyal class ships like the Ben Glow, seen here sailing from the bustling waters of Hong Kong. She was launched in 1961 at the same Glasgow Yards as her sisters, C. Connell and Company. The 11,391 gross tonne Ben Valor, the third of the Ben Royal class, had a service speed of 20 knots and elegant, pleasing lines. The Ben Royal ships created a magnificent image as they sailed in and out of the eastern ports. The fourth sister in this class was the Ben Armin, built by Barclay Curl and Company at their Glasgow yards in 1963, and she was the first ship in the fleet to have a swimming pool. But perhaps the most impressive conventional cargo ships ever to sail for the Ben Line were the new Ben Ledy class, introduced in the mid-1960s. They had a service speed of 21 and a half knots and reached over 24 knots on trial.
According to the long tradition of naming all the company's ships after Scottish mountains, Ben Ledi's new sister ship was the 11,958 gross ton Ben Wyvis. With her almost clipper bow, she reached Kobe in record time. With over 1,000 tons of cargo from Europe still in her holds, Ben Loyal moved off on the last leg of her outward journey, nearly 1,600 miles to Hong Kong. It didn't matter how many years a crew member had been at sea, arriving in Hong Kong was always full of interest and fascination. The last of the outward cargo was unloaded. It included another consignment of those British manufactured cars that are now such a rarity. And there was a brand new appliance for the Hong Kong Fire Department. With the captain's work never done, next it was time to read letters from the ship's owners and sign the ship's official logbook. And the captain also had to discuss the loading of homeward cargo with the ship's agents. Most important for the crew, he had to get money in the local currency so that they could go ashore and make up for all those well-behaved days spent at sea. Far away now from Hong Kong to New Zealand. In the small port of Napier, the Ben Arty was loading a cargo of wool. On this occasion, both she and a federal ship were all dressed up ready to greet a very important royal guest. Meanwhile, the Ben Loyal was once again ready to put to sea and to start the long voyage from Hong Kong back home to London. At the end of World War II, the Ben Line had only six vessels left in its fleet. By the 1960s, it had over 30 of the finest ships afloat. To be able to tell the story of both the Ben Line and the Port Line, we've had to use a certain amount of creative license. We wish we could have shown all the ships that once made up these two magnificent fleets. But sadly, most film and records, like the ships themselves, have long since gone. The Ben Line are no longer ship owners, but the name does live on both here and in Asia, where Ben Line is one of the largest shipping agencies. Major retailers such as Boots, John Lewis and early learning centres get their Far East products through a Ben Line spin-off. But that's a tiny legacy of a giant past. Whatever happened to all those boys and young men who went to those sea training schools all those years ago? Many rose through the ranks to positions of great responsibility. Many others fell in love with the people and the countries they visited on their ships and emigrated. Many went on to become prominent people of today, captains of industry or even film, television and pop stars. What bound them all together as special people were their shared experiences of a very wide world. Where have all those young boys gone? Where have all the young boys gone that went away to sea? Where have all the young girls who waited on the key? Where have all the tubs and grains pretend it's 
Where are all those dark side men?